Hey everyone, this is uh, Warren Wickman, and I want to welcome you all to the first session of the Health 2.0 and Digital Literacy course. Uh, this is going to be a, a brief introduction of Health 2.0 and what we're going to be talking about today and for the rest of the duration of this course. Again, my name is Warren Wickman. I'm one of the course directors. Dr. Julie Yum is one of the other course directors, and you can see our contact information here up on the first slide. So let's go ahead and, and really get into this, and I want to put the picture of technology of where it is today in a little bit different perspective. I don't really want to talk about medicine up front, but I want to throw some things out there that make you think about technology's role in society in general. So here is uh, my son when he was about 13 months old. And you know, maybe a couple years ago, this was sort of an unusual sight, but nowadays you'll see this a lot more and more, where there's young children able to sort of use tablets, learn how to swipe, and, and build a lot of these basic motor skills to how to use technology like this, but they have early, early exposure to it. Now, you know, he also has early exposure to other things like books. This is not the only thing he ever uses, but at the same point, there is that early exposure out there, and it's interesting to note. And you can see as he's getting a little bit older, this is him a couple months later, at 20 months old, he's getting a lot more nimble and facile with the technology, able to go through and find his apps that he uses. He's able to go through and locate content that he thinks is uh, useful for him, uh, finding his puzzles, etc., and really navigating the app very, very well. Um, and it gets a little bit further to you know him at three years old. There's this app here called Endless Alphabet, and it's teaching him how to, to learn and read. And so. You know, it focuses on letter sounds. He can, like his puzzle game, match it together. And as you can see, you know, he's learning to use spell words like pester. But it's crazy when you think about this app because it's allowing him to, to say and, and learn how to use words like gargantuan and famished, which for a three-year-old is, is pretty impressive. Uh, and not just to focus on one of my children. I want to say that you know the other one also gets involved as well. And he likes just trying to press all the keys and I'm trying to do email. So not to leave him out of the mix. But in general, there's this big trend happening with education right now where a lot of schools are moving towards tablets or other technologies earlier and earlier because it's become such a big part of just society in general and they really want to get our students and future students prepared for that technology. Plus just the ease of having all that content there is really intriguing for education. And there's great, great examples that are happening out there with technology use and adoption. There's one here by the one laptop per child and this is um, uh, a thing they did over in Ethiopia using Android tablets and it was really interesting what they had done they sort of dropped a giant crate of these Android tablets in this village um, gave them tablets no teachers no one to really help them out and said within about four minutes one of the kids not only opened the box but he found the on and off switch he powered it up within five days they're using 47 apps per child per day within two weeks they were singing ABC songs in the village and within five months they had hacked the Android OS figured out how to turn off the camera that was previously disabled. Now these are kids that don't have exposure to technology. This is a, a village in, in Ethiopia, um, not one of the more affluent areas. This is your sort of standard village there, non-English speaking, and students like this are able to really engage and figure out how to use this technology. And so it's becoming this pervasive thing that's very easy for young learners to, to use and be comfortable with. And when you look at the sort of the classroom of tomorrow, it's already happening today, it looks nothing like classrooms that I knew. It's um, it's very digital. There's a lot of technology in there. Students are using tablets, whatever they may be, to get online and to find more and more information. And it's changing how they sort of work together and changing the way that they collaborate. Now, if you think about you know this population, you know, these are seven, ten, twelve year olds. They're going to have this expectation where they don't know something, they look it up. They want to find something, they look it up. They can always find that information. And I want you to think about that's their expectation moving forward. And when you think about medicine, um, is medicine able to sort of meet that expectation? And I think I won't even give you the answer right now, but you sort of know where I'm going with this, right? Will medicine as a whole be able to address the needs of these patients who will be as connected and as savvy as these kids are? So I want you to take sort of a, a, a moment to think about um, some of these l listings on the slide here. Now, when was the last time any of you used a bank teller? or went to an individual to get your taxes done, or I guess more 
Um, interestingly, when's the last time any of you used a travel agent? So these are all, the, these first three are all almost specialized skill sets or professions or vocations that really no longer exist the same way they did 10, 15 years ago because of technology. You have things like online banking. You have things like TurboTax that allow you to do this all by yourself online, do your own reports. You have Expedia. You have Kayak. You have all these different services that allow you to book online. You don't need to have a travel agent anymore. Now, I left teachers, librarians, and lawyers in there because a lot of what technology has done has really changed what they do. Uh, you know, right now, when you think about it, there's a lot of free online courses. There's things like Coursera. You don't need to take a course at a community college or um, order a video online to learn. There's, there's different ways that you can learn without using the traditional model of education. Uh, much of what the librarian has done nowadays is is changing and evolving and curating resources because you have things like PubMed and digital journals and online journals. We don't need to physically go to the library to get a copy of an article. So it's changing their profession. And even lawyers are not, and attorneys are not, um, excluded from this because of sites like LegalZoom that allow basic legal legal services, wills, so on and so forth, can be done without having to see a lawyer. So it makes you think about, well, well what's medicine? You know, what? How does medicine play into this? How does the role of the physician going to change? You know, should you be able to, as a patient, pull in, do some of the basic stuff that physicians do? You know, diagnostics, lab tests, copies of your records, so on and so forth, scheduling, all those sort of things. You know, should you be able to do that? Um, are we able to do that right now? And the answer is no. How come medicine is that one field where we haven't had a lot of this technology sort of injection into the space uh, that leads to innovation? Um, but that's happening now a little bit, right? So many of you are familiar with a lot of this technology that's out here, you know, some wireless scales, uh, blood pressure cuffs that sync to your iPhone, other sort of... Uh, wearable devices that are out there, and this really is just scratching the surface. When you look a little bit deeper and see what's sort of coming next in the next year or so, there's already a lot of this stuff out there. Uh, pulse oximeters that, click to, that plug into your phone or leverage the light on the camera, portable ultrasound machines that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, things like the VSI Mobile, which gives you a full set of ICU vitals um, just right there on your wrist. You don't need a full ICU monitoring anymore to do that. And it gets even better. You have things for home diagnostics like an otoscope and a Scope that go to your phone. Now that they're on your phone, you can imagine you can take a picture and text it to someone or to your physician to get a really good sort of reading and reference from there. There's even this Alive Core EKG case, which is pretty awesome. It gives you a single lead EKG, and you can imagine that you know this diagnostic can be done if you're someone that has arrhythmias or known heart problems. If you're having chest pain, if you're having symptoms, you can you know take this out of your pocket get your EKG, email it to your doctor, or they even have a service now where you can put it up to the cloud and have it read by a specialist online. So it's really changing a lot of what's out there, and it's making people ask questions. You know, are we squeezing out the doctor? Are we changing the role of physicians in the center of healthcare? Is that changing and evolving? Uh, and the economist, I think, is right. I mean, they are suggesting that we're no longer at the center of healthcare, but I would, I would throw out there that it's great because I think... For this point, you know, patients are sort of becoming again the center of healthcare. A lot of this technology that we just talked about is all patient-centered, aimed at the consumer for the most part, and we're putting them back at the center of healthcare. And I think that's not a terrible thing. The thing that I think we have to worry about, though, are these other articles from the Atlantic saying, you know, why aren't doctors more tech savvy? This article focuses more on uh, emailing and interacting with your doctor online, using the technology we currently have to increase communication, and we're really not doing our job there and this article explores that a little bit but there's even a little bit older article from the Atlantic that throws out the big question is are doctors becoming obsolete um, and it's almost you know and scary to see something like that out there in a publication but I think it's really interesting to think about because a lot of these processes that we do um, are being replaced a lot of these diagnostics are being replaced by home technologies there's a lot of people that are sort of great innovators and thinkers um, really sort of challenging the role of the physician uh, and what can we do to make ourselves more efficient and make patients more efficient and I think these are things to think about um, and it's concerning because with all this pressure and this public perception about how medicine's becoming antiquated, we're not doing a very good job of encouraging our patients or sort of alleviating their fears that we're 
you know, that were tech forward or at least forward thinking. Uh, a recent study here done in early 2013 asked doctors if they should have, if patients should have access to their full medical record and two thirds of them said no. So this is the scenario where a patient approaches their doctor and says, I'd like a copy of my, my last history and phys physical, my last office visit and my lab tests. And the doctor says no. And there's heated debates all up and down the House of Medicine and even up through the AMA that um, says, you know, what you can and can't do with your own data. Now, it'd make a lot more sense if we're talking about someone else's data, but this is your own personal data. You know, what access can you have to your own data? Um, and there's, you know, this has gotten a lot of tension recently with sites like 23andMe, which was you know, a, a website that allowed you, a service, I should say, a company that allowed you to swab your cheek, um, pay a small fee, and allow it to get your genome to get sequenced, and that'll help determine risk factors for disease. Now, the FDA um, put the kibosh on them, sort of, to, to say it nicely, because they're concerned about just the validity of information, that you're getting information without interacting with a physician. But the question is, you know, instead of engaging with these spaces and trying to allow patients to get more into the discussion or allow to put ourselves more into that discussion, we're really resisting of what they're doing. And it's, it's, it's sad because when you think about medicine, oftentimes a lot of us still think about this when it comes to medicine. Now, this is a, a classic Norman Rockwell painting in the 1940s um, but a lot of people view medicine the exact same way from this painting you know it's it's a one-on-one -on -one face to face interaction um, everyone's very intent there's no computer in the room there's no EMR um, and it's sort of a way when when we sort of idealize medicine and probably when we thought about going to medicine we wanted this relationship this is all about that relationship between patients and phys physicians and it, this is kind of the the height of that paternalistic culture of medicine where doctor knows best and and at that period of time, we actually really did know best, mainly because there was this asymmetry of information. Doctors had the only were the only ones that had the data. Patients didn't have the data. And so because of that, there really couldn't be any discussion. There was just to do what the doctor says. You know, take two of these and call me in the morning um, really was the case because you didn't really know any better, and that's what you had to do. But that's really changed a lot now because of the technology. There's tons and tons of information out there, and patients have access to it. And that asymmetry of information no longer exists. And so a lot of thinkers, uh, sort of innovative minds within healthcare right now are saying that this era of paternalistic medicine is over or should be over because of this asymmetry being gone. But we still have a lot of physicians that feel that they should sort of protect their patients from certain items and certain data. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good or bad thing. And here's a dilemma we face. You know, 86% of our patients that have smartphones are using their phones to look up information. And this is sort of the, the percentage that we're looking at here in the past 30 days. 86% went online to look up something using their phone. And that represents about 62% of the entire adult population. So a little bit short of two thirds of the US population are using their phones to look up data. And oftentimes, a lot of that is gonna be around health data, right? And so that's a lot of people out there doing this. This is all data from the Pew Center Internet and American Life Project. Uh, the link and reference is right there. So the, the more concerning part when, you, when you're thinking about that is that about 35% of all US adults have gone online to try and figure out a medical condition. And these are what we sort of call our online diagnosers, right? And so that's a good portion. It's a, it's a third of the population doing this out there. It's not an insignificant number. And the more interesting stats behind this is that 53% of the time of those patients, 53% of those 35% of the population, uh, discussed their online diagnosis with a physician. So, you know, half the time this happens. But if you think about that, that's not very good, actually, right? So half the time that a person's going online, they feel that they can talk to their physician about this. Now, is this an issue of that the physician just happened to answer all their questions, gave them the right answer that confirmed their diagnosis, so they didn't need to bring it up that they went online? Or is this more of the case that they don't feel comfortable going to their doctor online because they've heard other things or they had a bad encounter? So this survey doesn't really go into the motivations of why or why not they discussed. They only give us this data here. But it's interesting because that's half the time this dialogue is not even happening at all. And if we're looking at a, a signing a letter grade, that's a big fat F, okay? So the more interesting data, or I guess even more concerning data, is that of that 35%, almost 40% of the time, information that they found made a patient did not seek care of a physician. Now that could be awesome because maybe they found something that was reassuring and they decided to stay home 
and save themselves a long office wait, et cetera, et cetera. But what if the information they read was wrong or incorrect or they misunderstood it, right? Um, then in that 40%, they're potentially putting themselves at higher risk by not going to seek medical attention. The problem is that we're not even having this dialogue in general. And so we have no idea who that 40% is and we could definitely intervene here if we just had that dialogue, which we are not having right now. And so I think this is where this really becomes important. And this is, you know, as I'm wrapping this up, you know, we really do need to be worried. Physicians need to adapt. Medicine is changing without us. I think the economist is right. The role of physicians at the center of healthcare is under pressure. Medicine is evolving without us. We've seen the rise of these mini movements of e-patients, quantify itself, peer-to-peer -peer health, participatory medicine, um, disease-specific social networks, all of these things that are patient-centric, patient patient-driven, and allow for a free exchange of information to and amongst our patients. And they're doing this because their exposure with us as physicians is very, very little. Um, if you think about it, the patients probably have one visit per year, and thinking, you know, the standard office visit is usually scheduled at 20 minutes, but how long during that visit are they really spending with the physician? How much time of that is facing? face-to-face -face and really important. And so when you think about what really got a lot of us into medicine, you know, about impacting patient lives and patient care and keeping patients healthy and happy, um, we can't do that in this span of seven to ten minutes that we really get to spend with our patients. You know, these things don't happen once a year for seven or ten minutes. And so patients are going in very many other circles and spaces, usually be using the technology to get sort of this um, bigger picture of health and to get themselves healthy and to answer questions that they may have. They're not doing this despite the system. They're doing this because they want to have ownership of their health and they have no other options. And so if patients are not leveraging our expertise, whose expertise are they leveraging? And so we need to get out in that space. We really need to be where those patients are so we can have this discussion. We can raise our sort of exposure time from seven to 10 minutes to much, much more because we're in the same circles that they are. We're using so social media where we're leveraging um, telemedicine and things like FaceTime and Skype to interact with our patients. We need to get beyond what we consider our traditional model of medicine because if we stick that way, we're really going to lose out on a lot of the discussion and we're really not going to be able to engage with our patients. And yeah, this is sort of my, my soapbox moment. This is sort of why I put this course together. This is sort of our wake-up call. This is you know my chance as an instructor to hopefully make a difference here because I want to expose you um, I want to expose you all to all these amazing things that are the technology that are happening out there just so that in one day three, four years from now, you're going to see a patient. They come to you with a printout of all of their bio, their personal biostats, um, you know, blood pressure, weight, et cetera, over the past month they've been tracking. You're not completely shocked by it. You're not thrown off by it. You understand what it means. When patients talk about doing genomic sequencing for pharmacogenetics, you get it. Um, you may not be the most well-versed in it, but at least you understand the concept, and that's my goal. Um, and unfortunately, the traditional medical school or nursing curriculum or pharma pharmacy curriculum doesn't really have time to cover this, and so we have to cover it in an elective, but I still think it's very important that we get this exposure out there. Um, and so, you know, by giving you this exposure now, hopefully it makes these things not foreign to you, so you won't be scared of that possibility of change or incorporating that into your practice. And so really we have this option where technology can really either dehumanize that patient physician interaction or even leave us out of it altogether or we can just strengthen that interaction if we get more involved it just depends on how you view it and how we utilize that so that's kind of the overview of the course in a nutshell um, it did get a little ranty at the end and a little bit on my soapbox but i feel very passionate about this and i hope you and uh, spend some time with us for the remainder of the course and learn a lot and have a lot of good questions thanks again